Welcome to Club Toasted's Toastedopedia section called The Way to Accredited Speaker. And here we are to get a better understanding of what the Toastmaster Accredited Speaker designation is all about. What's involved in attaining that accreditation. That's what we're going to find out today. Today, my guest is Valda Ford. She is a distinguished Toastmaster. She received her accredited speaker designation in 2018. And she presents keynotes and workshops to Fortune 500 companies. She is based out of High Point, North Carolina. Welcome, Valda. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcus. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. Splendid. Now, we're very curious about how, what the accredited speaker is all about. Maybe you can explain what a Toastmasters accredited speaker designation is. The accredited speaker program is reserved for those Toastmasters who combine subject mastery with professional speaking skills. I am a person who gets paid as an expert and I have the ability to rock the stage. That's what I want to hear. <laughs> nice. Now, what motivated you to become an accredited speaker and also a professional speaker? I became a professional speaker accidentally. I am one who doesn't mind saying what she thinks. And many times I would give my opinion and ultimately people would say, oh my goodness, I wanted to say that. I was too afraid to say that. I wish I would have said that. And over time, as I was working as an assistant professor trying to get ready for tenure, I became the go-to expert and people started to say, how much do you charge? I was thinking, are you kidding me? You're going to pay me to talk? People have been telling me to shut up and sit in the corner my whole life. And now you want to give me money. Okay, that sounds like a good deal. So I am an accidental speaker, did not plan it. But later, I had been a professional speaker for about 15 years before I got to know what Toastmasters was. And I feel like Toastmasters is the best kept secret in the entire world. And I found my home. I found my people. I found the ones who are like, not only do you like to speak, but woo. Can you speak on Tuesday at two o'clock for at least five to seven minutes? <laughs> and just being in Toastmasters, I became involved. I went into different officer roles. I became the district administrative manager, division. Uh, oh, all sorts of people in the division, in the district. And I thought the next logical step would be to get the designation from Toastmasters that validates my abilities as a professional speaker. And there are less than 90 of us right now. I'm number 81 and the only African-American female. So I feel pretty privileged to be an accredited speaker. And I think it just allows me to have more access to the world. That's fascinating that you were involved on the Toastmaster leadership side, as well as decided to go get the accredited speaker, because I've talked to a few accredited speakers who have just done that accredited speaker, and they haven't done the leadership side of Toastmasters. So that's interesting, intriguing. Now, maybe you can tell us what subject matter expertise in professional speaking that you talk about. My expertise, again, it kind of developed. Mainly, my, by education and training, I am a registered nurse at the graduate level. I have a graduate degree in public health, a lot of different certifications in one thing or the other. But because in my 20s, when I was a starving nurse trying to pay off my student loans, I was invited to work in Saudi Arabia. And I went to work there for a few years where I worked with people from 32 different countries. And while there, I got the, I was bitten by that whole notion of wanting to know more about people and learned how easy it is to miscommunicate without trying. 
And people started to ask me, well, you were in Saudi Arabia. Wasn't it tough being a woman in Saudi Arabia? You were in Saudi Arabia. You like to talk. Did they tell you to shut up and sit in the corner? You were in Saudi Arabia. This, 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 this. And I said, you know what? I loved my time in Saudi. And what I did there as a leader was learn how to make sure that we had safe, effective, efficient healthcare systems with people from 32 different countries who had 32 different potential ways of doing things. And so when I learned to do that, there were many people who wanted to know, how do you do that? And of course, in nursing and public health, having an understanding of language, culture, customs, and the beauty of the diversity of the world is something that I love and some people find difficult. So I have become the expert in that. Talking about experts, just out of curiosity, do you speak Arabic if you were in the Middle East? Sure. Ah, <laughs> salam alaikum. Okay, I don't speak Arabic. Uh, right? Salam. Okay, there you go. <laughs> I only know a few words. Great. I can go. I can go for a while. I'm actually pretty good at. Of course, hospital Arabic, I can ask you if you're bleeding, if you've eaten, all those things that if you come in an emergency, I loved it. I took three levels of Arabic while I was there. And each time I got a, I had a trainer or a coach from a different country and they would always say, who taught you to say it like that? (laughs) Then add my Southern American accent on top of that. It was like, "Mm." well, but people understood me anyway. <laughs> nice. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. What steps do you think you could recommend for those who want to become an accredited speaker? First of all, I ask, why is it that you want to do it? And for me, it was just a part of me becoming more and more immersed in the Toastmaster culture, because I, again, I think it is a fabulous organization that can help lift people up by helping them get over their fears and become more organized. And then find out if you have the ability to do it. You have to be a person who is getting paid to speak. So there are some people who just try to go for it and they try to manufacture places to speak. Mm -hmm. Mine was more organic. As I said, I was speaking out about what I love and what I believe in. And ultimately, people ask me to speak. So if you want to be an accredited speaker, know the topic. Know it cold. You don't have to be someone who has to be supported by a PowerPoint or a lot of charts and graphs. So know it, know it cold, and be passionate about it. Because if you're sitting up there very dryly doing data, 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 people are going to be like, Uh, And so, yes, you might get paid to speak, but they will be suffering through your presentation. My whole thing is love what you do, speak about what you love and know it cold. And then people will want you to come back and they will offer you money as they did me. I was like, "Whoa, this is really cool. They will offer you money and they will refer you. But there are some very specific steps that you have to go through to be an accredited speaker. And fortunately, there's a manual, but I can give you the specifics if you want me to give you a list of what is required. All right. First of all, review the application. That seems simple, but as a person who's been on the other side, looking at what's sent in, Mm -hmm. I can tell you that sometimes people don't get through because they don't pay attention to the directions. They start filling out the form before they read the book. Not that many pages, y'all. Just take your time and read the book. Then make sure you have completed at least 25 speaking engagements where you are in a non-Toastmasters environment. You need to be speaking to people who are not us, and they need to pay you, at least 15 of those need to be paid. The other thing is you must give a talk for 20 to 60 minutes. So it is not just standing in front of someone doing five to seven minutes, as we often do in our clubs, but to have the ability to hold an audience for 20 to 60 minutes. And then 
you will get feedback forms. You will ask five people to write you a letter of reference. And that letter, that form ask, were they good? Would you hire them again? And if they say no, well, that's uh, the end of it. Now, the other thing is that you must be speaking in front of a non-Toastmasters audience. And the, the thing that gets people in trouble many times is the recording. The recording, because we are now so electronically driven and we love to edit things and put things in our backgrounds, but this is just a pure recording. It is beginning to end from the time the person introduces you to the time that they come back on to say, thank you so much. It should have flow. The first part, your introduction should not just be Valda Ford speaks in 57 countries. But if I'm speaking on how not to put your foot in your mouth on stage, then my introduction should lead into it. And then I give my talk. I conclude the introducer comes back on and that is all one video. No editing, no splicing, no special effects. They want to see that you can rock it without a lot of technology. Even if you are using PowerPoint, someone just submitted an application where I specifically told the person, you know how you have the thumbnail when you're giving the PowerPoint and you're in the thumbnail? I said, that's really not going to fly. And the person said, that's what I do. I said, you need a video of you showing your stage presence and your ability to rock the stage. This is the time that we do not need to be dazzled by how beautiful your PowerPoint is. They require that you send it in, but they want to see you. We don't then, want death by PowerPoint. That time it was because we're so accustomed to this. I was actually coaching someone yesterday mm -hmm. and I was saying to him, that he had the most amazing slides, but I was tired of looking at him like this for 45 minutes. So please allow me to see you use a switcher or something. But in the accredited speaker process, it's about you and the stage, and it's not about the technology. Then you have to submit your application at a certain time. It only is accepted from January 1st to January 31st of each year. Then you are given notice as to whether or not your initial application gets through. And most of the time it doesn't get through because why? People don't read the application. And number two, their video is not appropriate. After that, if you get through, it is your opportunity to show up at the world, the international stage, the international convention, and stand on the big stage with thousands of your friends and peers and colleagues and rock the stage. And then if you do all of that beautifully, then you too will be an accredited speaker. Nice. So there is a certain degree of rigor there. Now, what was, I know it's not a competition, but when you went up on stage, were there other people with you? And, and how did they how did they do compared to yourself? I believe the year that I went up, there were nine of us. Six got through, three did not. Or well, that might not be true. <laughs> I can't remember. That's terrible that I can't remember. But I think six of us got through. And there were nine or 10. However, some years there's only one person who gets through. Other times there might be 12 people who get through. Sometimes we have a lot of people like that particular year because there were people who came back from the year before. Oh, okay. You do have the opportunity if you don't get through a level, whether it's level one or level two, to repeat it the next mm -hmm. year. And I don't remember, I'm sorry right now, if you have two or three times, but I know that say, if you put your application in in January 
and you get through, then you go to the international convention in August and you don't get through, you can come back the next year and do the stage part again. Mm -hmm. If you don't get through, then the next January, you can submit your paperwork again. Hopefully this time you read the application and your video worked and then have the opportunity to go. So it is rigorous. It is very specific and it is very much detailed in the application. Plus, those of us who are accredited speakers are happy to help along the way. You can get a professional coach if you want, but we are willing to look at what you're sending in and give you our opinions. Nice. And I know coaches can be a bit pricey depending on where you go. Did you have a coach yourself or did you use a Toastmaster coach? Like a, a paid no coaches for me. <laughs> I was fortunate enough that I did reach out to several people who were accredited speakers just to say, do you see anything I need to do differently? I remember Cheryl Roush found a mm-hmm. typo. <gasps> Horrors. <laughs> found a typo on my application and she pointed it out. It probably wouldn't have been a deal breaker, but I didn't want to send it in like that. I had four different accredited speakers look at my videos, look at different ones I thought I might send in, and they gave me their opinions. Nice. I've never used a coach. I have, well, I haven't used an official coach. Of course, I'm in Toastmasters, so we kind of have a whole bunch of coaches sitting in the room all the time. (laughs) But I, I haven't used a paid coach, even though I did try to one time. And she told me she didn't want to coach me because she didn't want to change me, which maybe is good, or maybe she just wanted me to go away. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, it's good. And it should be positive. Fantastic. So if you if you look back at what you did, any hurdles that you had to overcome? I mean, you went through the editing, you had Cheryl Rosh, whom I've heard of. She's come to District 42, which is the district I belong to, and she's presented there too. Mm-hmm. And you've had other people, other accredited speakers look at your stuff. But was there anything yourself you felt you you had to, a hurdle that you had to overcome? Procrastination. (laughs) Procrastination. There are many people who suddenly think, oh, I want to do this. Let me see. Let me look through. Let me see if I have this. Let me do. And I can tell you that my video, there ended up being a problem, even though I had done everything I was supposed to do. And the time that I was doing my professional video specifically for the accredited speaker rules, Mm -hmm. then the lights went out, the sound was poor, all sorts of things happened. And I had to send it in anyway. Fortunately, the people who evaluated it said that I was charismatic and I obviously knew what I was doing and they enjoyed it. So that's a tip for people who are looking at videos and deciding what to do. It should have good light and perfect sound. But if you do video at all, you know that if you have to sacrifice one, if the sound is good, then our eyes will adjust to the darker, the darker room. But otherwise, we should make absolutely sure that we don't procrastinate. So we can try out a video, we can think it through, get a few people to look at it, make sure that there's nothing glaring there that would be like, "Mm, uh, that really is not funny and that is actually offensive or I don't understand what you're saying or I don't want to see you in a thumbnail, whatever the case might be, especially now since we can do it virtually. And I think my biggest hurdle was having spent years either as a television host, a podcaster, a person who made videos for whatever reason, and wanting all those three camera angles, etc. I even paid people to do it, and they were so busy being involved in the high quality of a 1080p or whatever they were shooting, that then they'd run out of film because, you know, you know how, how that goes. So I needed a 780p that was great, but 40 minutes straight as compared to two 20 minute pieces of 1080p, you know, was, you know, so uh, those kind of things. The biggest thing is 
the biggest thing for me was just getting it done and getting it done early and having people to look it over. I'm kind of a one man show a lot of times, a one woman show. So I had to think through this. These are people who know this culture better. So let them help. Nice. Any recommendations for those aspiring accredited speakers out there? Yes, do it because you are a professional speaker or that is what you want to do. Don't just try to get the credential by going to a whole bunch of places where people pay you with a plate of chicken (laughs) or whatever. That doesn't count, by the way. (laughs) But yeah, just decide it's something that you want to do, not something you want to just add to a table of trophies. Mm -hmm. You love it. You want the designation for doing it. Because in the accredited speaker community, we are very much a family and we support each other all the time. So we have a true community within the Toastmasters community. The other thing is just speak about what you love. Be very comfortable and confident that it is not a long version of the world championship of public speaking. We want to see that you have depth. So if you are not the razzle dazzle presenter, but we know exactly what you're talking about when you're telling us how to retire without having to eat pinto beans and peanut butter the rest of your life. You don't have to sparkle, but if we understand it, it makes sense. And we know that you are credible, that will get you through. So don't worry about trying to be a world championship level speaker paying thousands and thousands of dollars to someone to get you to have that pizzazz because it usually doesn't transfer for 40 minutes anyway. But most importantly, just remember that Toastmasters has just a wealth of people, resources, and opportunities. So do your best, show your stuff, and rock the stage. Rock the stage. (laughs) All right. With that having been said, I want to make sure that you have yourself a wonderful day. Thank you once again for coming on and rock the stage. (laughs) Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.